Bandari, Professor of Department of Orthopedics, AG Institute of Medical Science, Mangalore. He has completed his MBBS degree from Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, and MS Orthopedics and D Ortho from JJ Medical College, Davangere. He has worked at Father Muller's uh, Hospital before joining us here. So without much further delay, I welcome Dr. Sudarshan Bandari to talk on shoulder MRI and ultrasound, what an orthopedic surgeon expects. Uh, good morning. It's always nice to be the first person to speak, especially when you have a large gathering like this. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the organizing committee and the organizing chairman for having invited me to speak. And uh, I must confess, I actually I am addressing a different crowd for the first time. We normally speak only to orthopedic surgeons. But the topic seemed interesting because very often what happens is uh, the radiologist would give you uh, a report and most often the most important information may be missing because primarily he may not know what exactly an orthopedic surgeon is expecting from a particular. The ramifications of these reports, I'm sure everybody knows, especially as a surgeon, the vital information if it is missing, the ramifications are huge. So, so anyway, what does what is our expectation? Primarily, of course, I think every town would expect a good musculoskeletal radiologist. That's number one. And it's important for the radiologist to understand what surgically relevant information he should impart as far as the report is concerned. And this ramification, again, as I was telling, can be disastrous if the wrong information is given. Forget so not enough information. Even if the wrong information is given, the ramifications can be disastrous, as it happened quite quite often. I'll just give you an example. The other day, I was called for an arthroscopic surgery, which was posted the next day, and the report was subscapularis tear. Now, when I saw clinically the history, the clinical examination and the report did not match, I was not very sure when I saw the MR itself because I, obviously I am not good enough. But then there were two reviews and we realized that it was not a subscapularis tear. Now, if this had not happened, this, I mean the condition was entirely something entirely different which did not need surgery. So, if this gentleman had gone under the knife, you can imagine. So, this is what happens in case we do not get enough information or if we get the wrong information. Anyway, now when we ask for an MRI, what are the conditions that we are primarily looking at? I mean, there are several of them, but most common instability as in multi, uh, as in uh, multiple dislocations, rotator cuff tears, biceps pathology, AC joint, cysts and arthritis. There are several others, but primarily we are looking at two, almost 80% of our business is around instability and rotator cuff. Now, recurrent shoulder dislocations may not be as common as rotator cuff, but I wanted to tackle with the, the instability first. So, what happens in instability? See, it's a clinical diagnosis. I mean, it's a no-brainer. The patient walks into office, he tells you, I have dislocated it X number of times. You know it's a shoulder dislocation. A primary cursory clinical examination will also give you information. Then, what everybody does, any average orthopedic surgeon would do, is ask for an MRI. And the report normally comes as labral tear. So we know what the pathology is. It's a bankart lesion. It's an anterior inferior labral tear. So once, once the labrum actually peels off the glenoid, the anterior glenoid, the humerus very comfortably dislocates. And you relocate it back, the labrum does not heal back onto the glenoid. And you will have the lesion that is persistent. And this open door allows the humerus to slip off and that leads to recurrent and multiple episodes of this. This is an arthroscopic view, this is your glenoid and that is your labrum and this is that detachment. So what we do is, we do an arthroscopic banker repair. Now it's a gold standard. You fix this labrum back onto the glenoid. What we do is, say this is your glenoid, that's the labrum that is detached. This has to be attached back into the glenoid. We used anchors, we use anchors. These are either metal or uh, different materials. This anchor goes into the bone and you have suture material popping out of these and this suture material then is threaded into the labrum and it is attached back onto your uh, glenoid. As you can see, if this was the tear, you have multiple sutures 
and the glenoid is attached. So this is your glenoid, that's a labrum and these are the sutures. Just a small uh, video. Uh, so as you can see here, this is the glenoid that is being drilled. That's your drill sleeve. You can see this plastic, that's, that's the anchor that is going in. Once the anchor goes in, you have the suture material coming out of those anchors. That's your labrum. This is one of the instruments we use to take a bite through the labrum. You take a bite through the labrum. You get hold of one of these sutures, come out on the other side and then we do what is called as knotting. You can see this knot being tied. The knot is tied outside the joint and it is delivered inside through special instruments and then cut it off. And then you can see that the labrum is attached back into the glenoid. So this is a standard bank cut repair. Works very well, beautiful, but there are problems. What is the problem? Now, arthroscopic bank card repair has significant failure rates. We must understand that though it is gold standard, there are failure rates. Now, I'm sorry. So what are the causes of failure? And what is the importance of these causes? You have soft tissue lesions, you have bony lesions. Till now we were thinking, we are talking only about the soft tissue lesions, but you must understand there are bony lesions. You all know that, bony bank card and hill sex. So why, why does a bank card fail? Now these are all the various causes and each one of them is important as a radiologist for you to understand and pick up and inform us. Now you have capsular distension and the inferior glenohumeral ligament tear. The IGHL tear has to be picked up if it is there because what are the ramifications? And you can see 22% incidence of IGHL. If the IGHL is torn, a bank card repair alone is not enough. We will have to do another surgical procedure. So you've got to remember that. If I do IGHL repair, if I don't do IGHL repair, my bank card will fail. See, similarly, if you have a humeral avulsion of this ligament, from the humerus if it avulses, it is very difficult to fix arthroscopically. I may have to open. What is the ramification? I will have to tell the patient ahead of time that I may open you. I may not be able to do it arthroscopically. So it's important for you guys to pick up Hagel. And we have Hagel lesions up to 5%. ALPSA, though it may be 5% responsible for failure, but very often we see ALPSA. What is an ALPSA? An anterior, I mean, uh, 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 labral uh, periosteal avulsion. So it's an avulsion of the periosteum. And it's just medialization of your labrum. We see this very often, especially what happens is now we get our patients after several episodes of uh, instability. 5, 10, by the time they come to you, this labrum has actually slipped medially and it is extremely difficult for us to pull it back. I will show that later. Now let's come to the business end. You see this anterior glenoid bone loss. 67% of the failure rates are because of anterior glenoid bone loss. If you add hill sacs lesion to this, which is very often present, the number goes up to 87. So you can see the importance of recognizing glenoid bone loss and the relevance of hill sacs. So what's your role as far as we are concerned? So I want my radiologist first to understand what I am looking for and then he starts looking for these lesions. Now that you know the importance of these lesions, Every time an instability workup is done, kindly look for these. Why? Because as an orthopedic surgeon, I want to preempt this. I want to know ahead of time, is this the lesion that I'm dealing with so that I can plan for my surgery. I can tell the patient that this is the surgical procedure I'm going to perform on you. Why? Because there are different surgical procedures for different problems. A soft tissue lesion, you have soft tissue surgery. But if it's a bony problem, then I'm going to do some kind of a bony surgery. Our arthroscopy may not suffice. So it's extremely important for you to understand this. Now, when you're looking for uh, lesions in an MRI for the shoulder, soft tissue lesions, lesions, what I'm interested in knowing is what is the extent of the labral tear? Why? Because the labrum can be torn globally. You could have a slap lesion. You could have a lesion extending from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock. You can have associated posterior labral tear. Now, what is the implication? I have got to tell my patient that I am going to use 5 anchors, 6 anchors. Each anchor is going to cost him 12,000 bucks. So if I am giving him a package of 60,000 and I am going to use uh, uh, about 5 anchors after I put my scope in. So you can understand what will happen. His bill will go up to 1.5 lakhs. Simple. And as far as my surgical time, everything. 
So ramifications are there. As far as an Hagel lesion is concerned, Hagel has to be opened in most hands. Very experienced arthroscopic surgeons may be able to fix it, but sometimes we have to open it. IGHL tear, we need to bony procedure. This is the only soft tissue lesion where I may end up doing a bony procedure. And of course, ALPSA. Like I was telling you, this is your glenoid, this is the labrum. Now, very often, we do not get the labrum in this position. What will happen is the labrum slips down. It is an avulsion of this labrum and it comes medially. So for me, it is important that I strip this whole thing and bring the labrum back and attach here. This is a very common lesion. So I, my interest is, if you tell me ahead of time that you are looking at an uh, ALPSA lesion, the quality of your capsule and labrum is not good, then I'm mentally prepared before going in for surgery that, you know, I, I've got to do this. And the quality, if it is not very good, I may be mentally prepared to go ahead and do a bony procedure. So this, recognizing these uh, lesions is very important. As you can see here, this is a glenoid, this is a humeral head. The capsule here, the whole capsule has to be elevated from this position and brought back to this position here. So that you can now... Now let's come to the importance of these bony defects. Now a vast majority of instability surgical failure is because of this bone loss. And if, in my opinion, if I want to work up, it is bone loss workup that I will do because a soft tissue lesion, I'm confident I will fix it arthroscopically. So for me, it's important to know what is the bone issue. So how do we go about, how do, not we, I mean, how do you go about measuring? I'm sure you all know how to do it. But just to, what I would ask for is a 3D CT with humeral subtraction. And I want an Omphos view. I want this view to compare with the opposite scapula, uh, opposite glenoid. As you can see here, there is a bone lesion that is a bony bank cut, but invariably it goes medially and you have practically uh, about 15 to 20 percent bone loss in the business area. This is my business area. So you, we know that the inferior half of the glenoid is a perfect circle. Okay, this is what we call as a pair. Now if you knock off about 15-20%, this becomes an inverted pair. You can see this, a fruit, a pair, this is an inverted, this is typically called as an inverted pair sign. So all you have to do is put in a perfect circle there, look at the radius. You can see, divide it into two halves by a line, and you can even approximately guess that this is going to be about 15-20%. to 20%. So for me, this bone loss, and this bone loss is attritional bone loss. Every time the humerus comes off anteriorly, it takes a small chunk of the glenoid. Now you can imagine that there is so much of bone loss. If you want to put the labrum back, where are you going to put? You are going to put it here, whereas it should have been here. Now once you have measured this bone loss, now what is important for me to understand? Do I ask for an MRI or do I ask for a CT? Because that, you see everything has an implication in terms of cost. Now I know he has dislocated several times. MRI is going to tell me, okay, there are some soft tissue lesions. But if I want to quantify, I want to get a CT. So you have an MR, you have a CT, cost goes up. Now, if I can get the same information in an MR, where you give me quantification of the bone loss in an MR, which is possible, whether it is 3D or even axial, there are several papers that have come out. Now, if you guys can give us quantification of the bone loss, I can do this with one single investigation. So, if I have asked for instability workup, kindly look for all these along with quantification of bone loss. Of course, uh, without 3D also, there are several papers that say finally, one of these papers, we recommend using MRI as the primary advanced imaging modality in evaluating glenohumeral bone defects. So, with one MR, if I can get all this information, there is nothing like it. So, what is our implication? What is the critical bone loss? For us, anything above 20%, I cannot do a soft tissue procedure. Then I move on to what is called as a bony procedure or a latagia. So what, I'm sorry, uh, what we do is, now you have bone loss here, so much of bone is gone, I cannot fix the labrum here. So what I do is I knock off the coracoid and the coracoid is transferred onto the inferior glenoid and fixed with screws. Double advantage of this being, I am retaining this circle, I am increasing the arc, Number two, I've got this conjoint tendon, the elongated the biceps and the coracobrachialis, which is attached to the coracoid. We leave it attached. So now when he abducts and externally rotates, the coracoid which is here is here. So the biceps now comes across as a sling in front. 
it will not allow the humerus to come out. So it's a double whammy. So we use this procedure. So now you understand that if the bone loss is uh, more than 20%, I have to prime the patient and tell him, I cannot do this. I have to do this bony procedure wherein I will be taking bone, I will be opening. Of course, we have started doing arthroscopically. This whole process can be done arthroscopically, but then the cost and the time, everything goes up. So you understand this. Now the critical bone loss is 20%. Fine. So what happens when there is subcritical bone loss? Now you have a patient who comes with 10%, 12%. You have to understand that these are bipolar lesions. Now you always have an associated hill sax lesion. And for me, the hill sax lesion is also important because when you have a hill sax lesion, why doesn't this work? So what happens with an hill sax lesion is we, you see, this is the glenoid, this is the hill sax. Now, in a particular position, if the hill sax falls within the glenoid, we are not bothered. But if the hill sax comes outside the glenoid, then it will dislocate no matter what you do with the glenoid. You understand? So for me, whether this hill sax is engaging or not engaging is important. As you can see, this is the glenoid, this is the humerus, this is the hill sax. And if the hill sax comes into contact with the anterior glenoid, it will dislocate if you do not do anything about it. So I want you to understand this so that you can then quantify this. Here is where this whole concept of glenoid tract is coming in. What is a glenoid tract? A glenoid tract is the tract created by the humeral head when you take the arm through abduction and external rotation. Now you external rotate and take your arm through a full arc of abduction. The humeral head creates an impression on the glenoid or the glenoid creates an impression on the uh, humeral head. That tract for me is important. Why is it important? <coughs> As you can see here, this is the glenoid, this is the greater tuberosity, this is the head and you have the rotator cuff. Only 84% of the humeral head actually comes into contact with the glenoid because this glenoid pushes the 16% of it is by pushing the rotator cuff. So this is my glenoid tract. This is very important for you to understand that it's only 84% of the total. So now what happens is you can see this concept of on track, off track. This is your defect or the hill sacs defect, this is your glenoid. Now it is within the glenoid tract, right? You see here the hill sacs is now outside the medial margin of the glenoid. This is off track. Very important for me to know in presence of subcritical glenoid bone loss, what is happening to my hill sacs? Is it on track? Is it off track? Now this you guys can give me information by doing MR study of what is the diameter of your uh, uh, glenoid? What is the extent of the uh, uh, hill sacs? And then you correlate these and give me whether your uh, hill sacs is on track or off track. I was very pleasantly surprised the other day when I got a report from Periyaram Medical College, mind you, Periyaram Medical College, which says hill sacs tracking or on track. I was really pleasantly surprised because immediately I knew what exactly I am going to do with this particular with this particular patient. So that is the story as far as instability goes. I will only touch rotator cuff pathology because I know you guys are dying to listen to the um, uh, to more about radiology and not orthopedics. But rotator cuff pathology, what am I interested in? Well, see rotator cuff tear always progresses. Whether you do anything or not, it will progress. And if it's a large uh, cuff tear, if you leave it alone, it over a period of time leads to rotator cuff arthropathy or what is called as osteoarthritis because of rotator cuff tear. So our aim is primarily to restore function and we do arthroscopic repair for most of these rotator cuff tears. And for me, it is important to plan for the surgery just like I did for instability. There's a short video again. As you can see, this is the cuff tear. We again put in an anchor. This is the greater tuberosity. These metal anchors or plastic anchors go in again, the similar suturing. Now what we have to do is we have to take a stitch, a bite through the cuff. So through the tendon we take a bite, we have several instruments. Once you take on a bite, you got to actually pull in the suture through that tendon. And then we tie these sutures and the tendon is brought back and sutured onto the greater tuberosity. So at the end of the day, it's a similar kind of a situation what we did. 
in uh, instability surgery, you got to put the tendon back onto the greater tuberosity. As simple as that. So what do I want to know before surgery and what you should tell me before I go in for surgery? You know that these can be either full thickness. If it is full thickness, I want to know the dimensions. If it is partial thickness, I want to know the depth. I want to know the tear shape and the extent of the, shape, of the tendon. And the most important, these tendons retract. Over a period of time, I mean, most of our patients would come late. The tendon would have retracted. I want to know how much it is retracted. And if it is a long-standing case, the muscle, as you know, atrophies, fatty infiltration, I want to know the grading of the fatty infiltration. And of course, please do not miss subscap. It is extremely important to deal with a subscap tear. So what is a partial thickness? Very often I get this uh, confusing report of a partial thickness uh, 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 supraspinatus tear. And I always keep wondering, is it is he actually talking about partial thickness or is he saying only part of the uh, supraspinatus is stone? No. Full uh, partial thickness means there is an absence of communication between the glenohumeral humeral and subacromial person. That means it is either on the acromial side, subacromial side, or, or either on the intraarticular side or on the bursal side. Simple. Whereas a full thickness means there is a complete communication. It is full thickness. The entire thickness of the tendon is torn. And then of course you have massive tears where two or three tendons are involved. Fine? So now let's look at a full thickness tear. That means the entire thickness of a tendon. For example, supraspinatus is tear. Torn. So I want to know what is the size of that. So we have classified it into small, medium, large and massive. Now if you tell me it's a full thickness massive rotator cuff tear. Done. I know that you are talking that this tear is more than 5 cm. Simple. If it's a small tear, then I'm mentally prepared. I'll tell him I'll put one anchor, then this is going to be a package. And I know it's going to be easy surgery. But if it's a massive tear, I may need three anchors. Now you're looking looking at 45, just 45,000 just for my anchors. Right? And plan for surgery. Right. Now you're looking at partial thickness tears. What do you mean by partial thickness tear? Now this is this is the greater tuberosity. This is your rotator cuff. Now if it is an articular side, we call it a pasta. That's a partial articular surface supraspinatus or whatever tendon avulsion, right? So articular side, we grade it, grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, either 1 4 thickness, half thickness, 12 thickness or 3 mm, 3 to 6, more than 6. Why 6? Because average thickness of your cuff is about 12 to 14 mm. So if it is more than 6 mm, we are looking at a grade 3. So if you tell me you have a partial thickness or a pasta of the supraspinatus, grade 3, totally impressed, I am ready for uh, uh, tackling this particular thing. Right? Similarly, on the bursal side, you have, and mind you, these, these cases are very common. And you may have a full thickness tear patient, you know, 61 year old, happily doing all this asymptomatic. But you may have a small grade 2 bursal side tear of the supraspinatus, extremely painful, the patient comes in, very symptomatic. We may have to deal with that. Fine, so now we are looking at a tear pattern. These rotator cuff tears have three or four distinct patterns. Most often what we will see is what is called as a crescent. Now you see this is the humerus, this is the cuff. Okay? This is a supraspinatus tear which is a crescent shaped. Something like this. You can see like this is the uh, greater tuberosity. That's your cuff. We always assess because our repair depends on the type of tear. Right? And you see this is an L shaped tear. You can see that. That's an L shaped tear which is going and sitting like that. So if I'm going to do a repair, I will do a side to side repair here and then put in an anchor here. So for me, entire thing depends on how I'm going to plan this, how many anchors and then you have a massive tear. <coughs> you see this, this is a massive tear, right? It is difficult because these massive tears may involve one or two tendons, large number of uh, anchors required, longer surgical time. But then I'm mentally prepared when you tell me you have a massive thickness tear of supra and infra. Right? Now we come to the really important aspect of, uh, see most often our patients come invariably after 3 months, 4 months because your uh, orthopedic surgeon would uh, normally say no, do physiotherapy, this, that, then they will go for second opinion, third opinion. By the time they decide no, this is trouble, they come to you, it's about 4 to 5 months. Now what has happened in the meantime is, the cuff that initially in the first say 2 or 3 weeks, you would see that the cuff even a full thickness tear would remain here, right? Which is just at the insertion site or just in and around the insertion site into the greater tuberosity. You see after a six weeks time, you would see a grade two which has come up to the humeral head. 
Now, you know what is happening, it is contracting. And for me to pull it and put it here, depends on whether it is freely mobile or not. I'm not really sure. Now we are looking at a grade 3 where it has gone beyond the cleaner. Now, grade 3 tears are what we call as irreparable tears. Now, these tears you cannot repair. You forget about doing a primary arthroscopic or open rotator cuff repair. Now, you are looking at what else can I do? What else can you do? You can do a tendon transfer or you can replace the joint or you can do now what is called as patch grafting or superior capsular reconstruction. But, you cannot do anything with that graft. I mean, with that uh, cuff. That tissue is gone. So for me, it's extremely important when you tell me, I'm sending you a four-month-old rotator cuff tear. If you tell me it's a massive supraspinatus tear, of what use it is to me? Because if this cuff is not repairable, I already have to tell him, sorry, pal, this is not repairable. I will have to do something. Tendon transfer has huge ramifications. You take the latissimus dorsi from here, shove it here, all sorts of issues. Or you do a what is called as a reverse uh, replacement, arthroplasty massive ramification. So, for me it is important for you to, re to give me a full detail of where the cuff is, what is the quality of the cuff to which we come now, what is called as fatty infiltration. Now, over a period of three to four months, this muscle will atrophy and will go in for fatty degeneration. Now, Butelia has classified it into four grades and if you can give me a grading and again, I've got reports where they have actually graded the fatty infiltration. Now, you see this image. Now, when you lie, when you draw a line through this, uh, through the scapula, this particular image, if it is in this shape, it is what is called as normal. Now, when you have streaks of fat, you can see fatty infiltration, grade 1. Grade 2 is more muscle than fat. Grade 3 is equal muscle and fat. Grade 4 is more fat than muscle. Now, up to grade 3, up to grade 2, I am okay, I can repair anything. Okay? Now, grade 3 plus or minus. Grade 4 is a contraindication for repair, for primary repair. So, now you do understand that when I am looking at grade 3 and 4, then I am already starting mentally to prepare myself that this cuff may not be repairable. I have to tell my patient, I am sorry, you are late, I may have to think of doing something else. So, the two most important things, tendon retraction, fatty infiltration. Again, mild, moderate, severe, depending on which tendon and how much of it is actually. So, please look into this, give reports as far as fatty infiltration. Right? Now, finally, before I end, subscap tear is extremely important for you to realize that subscap, it is, it is, like, uh, a, it is like a bridge with its suspension. Right? This is your supraspinatus, this is the infra, this is the subscap. And if you do not repair the two uh, anchors of your bridge, that bridge is going to collapse. So for me, it is extremely important that I fix the subscap back. One of the indications of a complete tear is when the biceps dislocates. So the sling, the bicep sling, it depends on an intact subcap. So if the subcap is torn, you will have a dislocated bicep. Just gives you an indication that there may be something going on with the biceps. The bicep grading, etc. I mean the subscap grading, etc. I will not go into. You can uh, just check it out. But for me, if you tell me that there is uh, subscap suspicion, again I will have to start mentally preparing because arthroscopic repair of subscap is challenging. So to conclude, I would just say that, you know, a adequate preoperative imaging, I mean information from imaging goes a long way in planning surgery, right? Whenever there is an instability workup, kindly look at those issues as far as soft tissues are concerned but concentrate to a large extent on what could be the bone loss. Dimensions of the cuff tear, retraction, atrophy and involvement of subscapularis. These four if information if I get as far as uh, cuff is concerned, more than happy. There are several other indications and uh, I cannot go on and on. So, I will stop at this. These two are the most important as far as an orthopedic surgeon is concerned. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Yeah, I will take a few questions. I'm more than happy to answer all your queries. I'm sure there will be a few. Yeah. No, no, no. It is not done on the upper position at all. I do not exactly know how it is done as far as uh, you know your uh, MR is concerned. I have tried to figure it out, but of course it is beyond me to understand. Okay. Just similar to how we do a normal 
all the right data squares inside the game. So that an actual game. And uh, that should be enough to give us an answer for the fact that we just talk about Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that is important information for us because uh, when you have subcritical bone loss and you have an off-track uh, um, uh, hill size lesion, we have to do what is called as a rumpling size. That is, you have to fill the defect. So what we do is we put in a couple of anchors at the back and we insert the infraspinatus into that. So the infraspinatus not only fills up your defect, but it also has a posterior pull on your humeral head. So you are balancing this bipolar region. You do a uh, anchor or a labral repair on your liver. You do a remplacement on your inside, which is pulling it back and this is stabilizing. So you have a bipolar fixation. This is very important for us to again see two anchors we use. The cost goes up, and I've got to tell the patient about this. So uh, tracking is important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.